<clears throat> Hello again. This is now the old part three. No, I guess it's still part three. Um, and we're going to visit Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. So uh, here's some fan art for your visual pleasure. So Impressionism began when artists began to paint outdoors, or en plein air. That's the French term for outside, in full air. In an effort to record fleeting effects of light and atmosphere. Generally, the subjects are light and contemporary, often depicting Parisians at leisure. So I hope you see sort of the, uh, the relationship between this theme and the realism, which was just ordinary, everyday scenes. So um, this is a painting by Claude Monet, who was the father of Impressionism. You will need to know that. And this is his uh, painting on the bank of the Seine, Benincourt. From 1868. That is his wife just sitting out on a summer day, it looks like, looking out over the river. So this is really before Impressionism as a movement began. This is before it became really full-fledged, but I'm just using this to illustrate how loose his brushworks are, his brushstrokes are, his brushstrokes are, and how lightly he has modeled her just with dabs of paint and, but it all feels very fresh. The colors are all cool. It's an outdoor scene. He painted it outside. So this is kind of what the Impressionists are all about. And this is the painting that really started the whole thing. We called this Impression Sunrise. And um, this name, the title of this painting, coined the name for the movement. Um, a critic absolutely hated this and said similar things to what um, the critic said about Whistler's painting, that it, it's not a painting, it's not finished, it's just, it's just paint like thrown onto a canvas. It's not, it's not good enough. It's not, not thorough, not, doesn't show enough work. Um, and yet, as you're looking at this, I will bet none of you have any difficulty figuring out what's going on. So it's not like the artist really has to put a lot of detail in it. You can tell that there's a body of water. You can see some boats and figures. It looks like it might be um, very early in the morning, the sun appearing up over here. And the water, just dabs of paint across here. So one of the ideas of Impressionism was that um, the artist paints what he sees from where he is. And he could not swear that there were buildings over there or ships or anything in that haze because everything was kind of lost in a haze. And so all he did was paint the haze. So he's not lying. He's just saying, this is all I see. I can only give you my impression of what I see. This painting I really like. So this is one by Manet, the guy we just saw, the guy who was um, painting Olympia in the earlier part of the 19th century. He was a friend of Monet's. All these guys knew each other. And he did this painting of Monet in his boat painting. So this is how this Impressionist worked. He sat out in nature with his paints, it looks like his wife is there probably to hand him a cup of tea when he gets thirsty. And he's painting whatever he's looking at over on this side. So, Manet paints Monet in 1874. And this is Manet's painting that we just looked at the very end of um, part two, A and B. Um, so, I want you to notice the difference in styles. So Manet's personal style has also changed. He's gotten much looser. Look at the, the treatment of the water here and the light brush strokes up in the sky. Even the, the modeling of the figures here is much, much freer than it was in Olympia. So this is um, the influence of the Impressionists. Now, Monet... We're going to look at several of his because he was so important. So he was interested in the fleeting effects of light. 
So all he could do was paint the light that he saw. I mean, if you think about it, that's all anybody can do is they see light reflected off of surfaces, and that's that's what goes into your eye, and that's what you see. Um, so he wanted to study the the effects of light throughout a day. So he went to this town of Rouen, and he rented a room across from the cathedral there, and he brought all of his paints and several canvases, and as um, during a day, like when he woke up in the morning, he started on one painting, and then as the sun moved, he would change that out and bring up another canvas and, and work continually rotating the canvases throughout the day so that he got different uh, lighting effects on the cathedral. So the subject was the same, his perspective, his viewpoint was the same. The only thing that changed was the light. So this is, um, let me say, this is Rouen. And here is the one I just showed you. Here's another one. And here's a photograph of the cathedral from approximately the same viewpoint as um, Monet had painted. Just FYI. Now, if you look at these, um, I, I'd like to have my students always make a guess. Which one of these do you think was painted earlier in the day. Yeah, this, yeah, we usually pull this, um, pull every which of these painted earlier in the day. What do you think? So think about that, and then I'll tell you. So you can see, like I said, the subject is the same, the angle, the view, viewpoint is exactly the same but you start to see considerable difference in the colors on the stonework of the cathedral. This one is earlier in the day, and the secret to that is that the facade of almost all of the Gothic cathedrals is on the west side of the building. That means as the sun comes up in the east, um, the first view on the west facade would be all in shadow because the sun is on the other side of the building. And then as the sun moves around during the day, it fills up this little niche, this little uh, portal more and more with sunlight. So you can look at the sides of that shadow there. This is earlier. As the sun fills it up later in the day, it gets smaller. The shadow gets smaller. Oops, sorry. Did not mean to do that. Um, okay. So here's um, a group of four of these, just FYI, so you can see. He was very serious about this. I don't know how many were in the series, but um, there's four right there. So here's another Monet. Um, in this way, I think he looks like he's been seeing Turner, and we know that Turner and Constable were both highly influential to the French Impressionists. So Turner is the guy who did the, the Snowstorm in the Alps. This is before Whistler's painting, so um, putting Whistler where we did, it does get a little confusing. But what he's doing here, he painted this train station, and uh, he's not interested in the trains. What he's interested in is what happens when all that steam comes out of those locomotives, and it goes up into this shed up under the roof, and it distorts things that we see, and it alters our view. So another thing that is pretty common with French Impressionists, because they're just painting the light that is reflected from things, is there's almost never any black. Or if they use black, it's very judiciously, only for local color. And that means the color of the object that you see. Um, Occasionally, but they would never ever use black for a shadow for shading. Now, here's another Monet of a street scene. So, their colors are generally very light, very pastel, lots of loose brushworks, um, and no absence of black. In this case, we do see some black because people are wearing black suits. So, he's representing that. I think I have a detail there. And you can see that uh, you have no problem interpreting all of these brush strokes as people. 
I mean, but look at what what vague little ciphers they are. Um, it's kind of amazing and delightful. So um, cool colors, and like I said before, you might not have caught that, is that everyday life, usually Parisians at leisure are one of the subjects. And the main leisure day in, in France for everybody is Sunday. That is the day when people do not work. And so they take the day off, they'll go play in a park um, or go to a restaurant, go with their friends, go out boating, go out to the forest, but it's a recreation day. So in his later years, Monet bought a, a house out in the country and in the grounds in his yard around the house, he put in a lily pond um, and a bridge and he planted all these beautiful flowering plants and then he would just spend his days out there painting and his paintings got loose, much looser towards the end of his life. So this is one of his major uh, water lilies. But just notice how all the colors are very cool blues, violets, and greens. So it's very soothing. This is why French Impressionism is so popular now. So another artist, another Impressionist artist is uh, Renoir. And I, I also told you all of these guys knew each other. They didn't all get along, but for the most part they did. So Renoir here illustrates what I just told you. Um, leisure activities of Parisians on a Sunday. So they're all at this Moulin de la Galette. They are dancing, uh, drinking, talking, eating with their friends. It's how you spend a pleasant summer day when you don't have to work. Obviously, somebody there is working because somebody's serving them, but um, there you go. And here's um, a painting by one of the women. This is Berthe Morisot. She was... Mm, uh, Manet's sister-in-law, and there are a couple of women in this group. So this is uh, the work of one of the women. This is Bert, and she shows a, two women at leisure on a little rowboat out in a lake. Just look at the color palette here, almost all cool colors again, little yellow on their straw hats, the ladies' straw hats, but these are genteel ladies. They are not... Um, working class, they are not prostitutes, they were out just enjoying a day on the water. Now look at how loose all the brushwork is. This is French Impressionism. So here's another Impressionist painter who has a completely different take. Um, this is Edgar Degas, and he's very interested in movement and in bodies and physical poses. So he does a lot of studies of dancers. Um, he's interested in patterns of motion. He also experiments a lot with composition, so does things in a very interesting and different way. So one thing is notice his viewpoint here. He's kind of elevated, um, looking down on the group of dancers. And there's also a large swath over here in the, across the top and on the left side of figures with a void and empty space down here. Yet it doesn't feel out of balance. So that's what I meant by experimenting with this. Instead of following Leonardo's uh, dictate about things being very s stable and there's no action, he's really pushing the envelope on that. And then another thing he does here um, with this dancer on the left side, he just cut her off right down the middle. Well, nobody would have ever done that in history before. You just don't do that. You know, if you're including a figure, you'd show her entire figure. You wouldn't just cut her off in the middle. Um, we can see the dance instructor over here, director, and over here is a couple of sugar daddies who are waiting around. They would uh, finance the girls, give them money in, in exchange for favors, it's not very savory, but it's kind of the truth. So let's look at another one. So here's some more. So this is what he's best known for is the dancers. But he also did series at racetracks and did a lot of horses and stuff. Uh, so Degas, I think, is very interesting. He's also influenced heavily by Japanese art. And so that's one of the reasons we get these unusual compositions. So in this one here, 
um, just notice how there's a diagonal line across here with the lower right corner being full of figures and one or two little figures up here in the upper left that balance them out. It's all fine. And on the right is a sculpture um, or a copy of the original sculpture. So I don't really know where the original is. I've seen several copies, but Degas wanted to make a three-dimensional little ballerina and so he modeled her out of wax and now there have been bronze castings made of it but when he got to the little tutu or the skirt um, he I think he was frustrated with trying to make it out of wax so he put a real tutu on the wax figure and that becomes <laughs> kind of revolutionary it's a mixed media sculpture um, when traditionally everything had been all bronze or all marble or all whatever um, he puts real fabric on her and here's one of the copies in the the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC I went there spring break of 2019 and took some nice pictures of her so you can see it's a real skirt but she's not real Mary Cassatt she's our other prominent woman impressionist um, she's an American. She was an expatriate, meaning she's not living in America. She lives in Paris. She befriended Degas. She hung out with the Impressionists, but she had her own circle of friends and does a lot of paintings of them, of mothers and children. Um, this mother and child here features a contrast between the loosely painted clothing. Just look down here at her skirt and how loose that is, uh, with a really tight tightly modeled face of the child and the mother. So brings our focus into the place where the character is and then lets, lets it all hang loose down here. Um, so I told you that Degas was looking at Japanese artwork and Japanese prints were being imported into Europe and uh, were wildly popular, especially with the French artists. So there's a whole study of the influence of this different aesthetic on the French painting that's called Japonisme, but um, just take my word for it, and I'm just going to show you one example. So this is um, a young woman looking at a, point, a pot of pinks. So notice the unusual perspective here, or lack of perspective and the simple line, the balance, the composition is very unusual. So this was something that is thought to have influenced Mary Cassatt when she did this print of a woman, a French woman, washing her face. A woman bathing, she's washing. Okay, that's um, the end of chapter 18, part three. So stay tuned, there's more coming.